Finance is the study of money management. In finance, we build return prediction models, examine how money flows to and from investors, and identify how firms and investors manage money. Every other area of business relates to finance, since one of the roles of financial managers in a firm is to determine the appropriate allocation of money to various projects, investments, and accounts. Understanding finance allows an individual who is majoring in another discipline to effectively understand why certain decisions are made by their organization. This is the same reason why everyone is required to take marketing courses, management courses, etc. Most companies want to see a cost-benefit analysis for an increasing number of decisions in all areas of the firm. Consequently, the business students of today will need to be able to use financial principles even if they are not a part of a finance functional group. At a personal level, they will be making financial decisions for themselves and their families for the rest of their lives. Now, there are several financial principles I want to immediately state because of their extreme importance. First, more of an asset is seen as better than less than an asset, since assets offer investors some positive utility or value. Second, the sooner cash is received, the better. The saying, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, is somewhat appropriate in our field, since once you receive cash, there's no uncertainty about when you're going to be paid. Finally, less risky assets are preferable to riskier assets. When I say risk in this course, I'm referring to the volatility of an asset's returns. A return is the percentage change in an asset's price. When return volatility is high, investors are more hesitant to purchase that asset without some additional compensation, such as a higher expected return. There are arguably four main subfields of finance, although this breakdown can vary based on who you ask. Investments refers to the decisions of businesses, institutions, governments, and individuals about which securities to buy or sell. Investment professionals often perform valuation or spend their time managing portfolios of securities like stocks or bonds. Managerial or corporate finance refers to the decisions made by employees of a company about how to manage cash flows. These decisions include, but are not limited to, dividend policy, capital budgeting, inventory management, and financial policy. A financial market is a market in which people trade financial securities and derivatives such as futures and forwards. Securities include stocks and bonds and precious metals. You've undoubtedly heard of stock exchanges like the NYSE or the NASDAQ. These are examples of financial markets which allow investors to trade stocks, but there are bond exchanges out there. Financial services are the economic services provided by the finance industry, which include commercial banks, savings banks, credit unions, and credit card companies, as well as insurance companies, financial planners, and brokers. Many people think of financial services as primarily banking and insurance, but the industry is much broader than that. Let's talk about each of these areas in a bit more detail. As I just mentioned, investments focuses on valuation and asset allocation. Investment professionals must decide whether to add a certain asset to their portfolios based upon whether the assets meet the portfolio's objectives, whether they offer an appropriate expected return relative to their level of risk, and whether the asset adds some diversification benefit to the portfolio. There are two types of assets we refer to in investments, real and financial assets. The value of real assets is tied to their tangibility. So think of a car or a home. You can use either of those things. The value of financial assets is dependent upon the, their underlying real assets. Examples of financial assets are stocks and bonds, whose value is derived from the underlying assets of the firm or government that issues those stocks or bonds. Asset allocation is a term often used in finance, and it refers to the strategy of building a diversified portfolio of assets to ensure that when the value of one asset or asset class falls, the value of the other assets in the portfolio do not. This is the fundamental idea behind portfolio diversification. Investment professionals who are able to construct portfolios that offer their firm or their clients high returns or returns that beat expectations or beat competitors or some benchmark 
can often make a very large amount of money through commissions or a bonus or just their base salary. Now, the investment industry involves a number of different roles. Brokers buy and sell assets on behalf of their clients. Financial advisors make recommendations for their clients to follow in order to achieve financial goals. Portfolio managers obviously manage portfolios and try to be beat a benchmark. Security analysts attempt to value securities and collect information about the security for an organization that employs them. Actuaries, particularly pension actuaries, attempt to ensure a pension fund is able to pay out exactly the amount owed to individuals who have money in the pension fund. Investment bankers have a large number of roles, but historically they help companies and governments sell new assets to the public for the first time, and they help oversee mergers. Financial services firms, or financial institutions, as I said earlier, are companies that specialize in financial matters and help organizations and individuals manage their money. The most prominent examples of financial institutions, which is the term I'll try to use throughout this course, are banks, insurance companies, and brokerage firms. It is important to note that as a result of the Great Depression, financial institutions were not allowed to provide banking, brokerage, and insurance services all at once. The U.S. federal government mandated after, right after the Great Depression that these services be provided by separate institutions, separate organizations. As a result of several pieces of deregulation in the 1990s, like the Regal Neal Act of 1994 or the Financial Services Modernization Act of 1999, banks were allowed to operate across state lines and offer brokerage services to their clients. This deregulation in the 1990s has allowed the banking industry to consolidate, and it was arguably one of the greatest contributing factors to the 2008 financial crisis, since many banks became too big for the federal government to let fail without setting off a complete collapse of financial markets. An example of a large financial institution is Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs' total assets are right around $962 billion dollars as I record this video, which is larger than the GDP of all but about the top 15 countries. The firm is technically a commercial bank, but it also underwrites or sells new securities. The firm also lends money to firms and governments around the world. To put the scale of Goldman Sachs in perspective, at the time I'm recording this video, Goldman Sachs' total assets were almost five times larger than the GDP of the country of Greece, which had a GDP of about $200 billion. An even more amazing fact is that Goldman Sachs isn't even the largest U.S. bank. J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, Citigroup, and Wells Fargo are far larger. Managerial finance is just another name for corporate finance. Students often get confused by the terminology, especially when different terms are used to refer to the same thing. In the real world, most people say corporate finance. Now, corporate finance refers to the financial decisions which are made by individual firms. Financial managers have to decide how a firm will manage its cash. They have to determine what long-term investments the firm will make, how the firm will raise capital or cash to finance their operations, and how the firm will manage its cash on a daily basis to avoid a stock out or having unsold inventory sitting in a warehouse. When someone is in corporate finance, they're often referred to as a financial manager. The top financial manager in a business is often the chief financial officer, or CFO for short. The CFO can also be the president or a vice president of the company. Regardless of their actual title, the CFO has two primary roles. First, they have to act as the firm's treasurer, ensuring that the firm has enough cash on hand to pay for daily expenses and operations. Second, the CFO must oversee the firm's accounting functions. They're responsible for paying the firm's taxes. The CFO or VP of finance role is usually filled by someone with both an accounting and finance background because the position has responsibility for both the controller and the treasury functions in a firm. In smaller firms, financial managers also handle the accounting of the firm. Often, the CFO will also be a CPA or certified public accountant. The CFO is overseen by either the COO, Chief Operating or Chief Operations Officer, or the CEO, 
obviously chief executive officer. The CEO of a publicly traded firm is overseen by the board of directors who are elected by the shareholders of the firm. Usually there's an annual shareholders meeting and most of those meetings will take place in May or June of any given year. Now, financial managers have a number of different jobs besides just something that they work on day to day, like uh, cash flow management. Uh, they're often in charge of the capital budgeting of the firm. So capital budgeting is often the process of determining which long-term investments or which projects the firm's the firm will take on. So should this firm, let's say, acquire a new piece of equipment, or should this firm acquire a new piece of land, or should it invest in some new line of products, or should it uh, hire a bunch of new scientists to develop some new vaccine? Uh, all of those are capital budgeting decisions. They're long-term investment projects that the financial manager has to determine whether or not they're they're financially viable, whether or not those for, those projects will offer the firm a high enough return. Now, financial managers also have to determine the ideal capital structure for the firm. And when I say capital structure, what I mean is the relative weight of debt and equity on the firm's balance sheet. So some firms are in industries where there's extreme cash flow volatility. So think the travel sector, for example. Uh, in years where there's a financial crisis, really not a lot of people are traveling. And so firms that are in the travel sector don't like to have a large amount of debt on their books. So one of the most important roles of a financial manager is to determine the ideal capital structure, the ideal amount of debt versus equity that the firm is using to fund its its operations. Now, the most important role of a financial manager day-to-day -day is working capital management. And working capital management is essentially how the firm manages its current assets and current liabilities. Uh, so the, the short-term assets and short-term liabilities uh, to ensure that the firm has cash available and it doesn't face a liquidity crisis. There are some other decisions that a financial manager has to make. Uh, for example, payout policy. What is the firm's payout policy? Does the firm pay a regular quarterly dividend or does it not? Uh, if a firm has a large amount of cash on hand, it can also repurchase stock. In other words, it can buy back its own stock by paying its current shareholders to give up those shares. So payout policy just refers to how the firm compensates its current shareholders. Another financial management decision that the CFO or financial managers under the CFO have to make is with respect to M&A or mergers and acquisitions. So does this firm acquire a direct rival? Does it uh, allow itself to accept a takeover offer? Uh, most M&A decisions are going to come down to whether or not an acquisition by a firm let's say the firm is acquiring a firm, uh, a direct competitor, or let's say a, a supplier, or maybe even a, a buyer. Most of those decisions are going to come down to whether or not there's potential synergy with respect to that merger. In other words, does the combined firm, the your firm plus the firm that your firm is acquiring, is the sum of those two firms greater than its parts? So the classic example of synergy would be that of Standard Oil Company. So back around the early 1900s, John D. Rockefeller, who is arguably the richest man to ever live, he, he ran Standard Oil Company. And Standard, uh, th their process for driving competitors out of business was to, uh, they owned the oil wells, but then the firm started buying up wells of direct competitors, and then also the railroad lines, and also the railroad cars to transport the oil. So what you ended up having is this firm that pumped the oil out of the ground also owned the means for transporting that oil to get it refined and get it into gas stations. 
Uh, so the benefit there is that you don't have to, or your company that pumps oil out of wells doesn't have to pay exorbitant fees to transport that oil, to refine that oil, to sell that oil in gas stations. You've reduced those costs by simply owning any potential buyers that you're, you're passing the oil down to in the supply chain. Now, uh, one final financial management decision that I'll mention is an IPO. And an IPO, typically this only happens once, if at all, in a company's life, life cycle. And an IPO is an initial public offering. And this is the decision of the firm to start to sell their shares to the public for the first time. Now, there are a lot of companies out there uh, in the real world. There's a lot of small businesses. There's a lot of uh, medium-sized businesses. There are relatively few publicly traded companies. That is, companies whose shares trade on a stock exchange, like the New York Stock Exchange. Now, the reason there's relatively few publicly traded firms out there is because most firms, most small firms, they don't have enough shares to make a liquid market for their shares. They don't really need to sell their shares or have those shares traded on a stock exchange. However, firms like Apple or Goldman Sachs, they have a huge number of shares and a huge number of shareholders who want that liquidity, who want that ability to sell their shares whenever they want for a fair price. So once a firm gets large enough and it can't raise any more money from its private shareholders, typically what it'll do or the financial manager will do is they will determine that it is time for an IPO. It's time for our shares to be listed on a stock exchange. And so that's the IPO decision. And once a firm makes an IPO, uh, makes the decision to undertake an IPO, it'll typically reach out to an investment banker like Goldman Sachs. All right, so with that, I'm going to wrap up. And in the next video, I'll start to talk about the forms that firms take. So I'll see you on the next video.